Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Michael Kaminsky. Really excited to be here. Today I'm going to be talking about um, Kaplan-Meier analysis, which is a sort of tool from biostatistics that we use at Harry's. Um, this talk is going to be about half data story, half biostats lecture. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of math, so buckle up. Um, Harry's, what do we do? We sell razors online. Um, we also sell some other stuff. We sell shave cream and face wash um, and a bunch of other things. You guys should check us out. Um, primarily, right now, our business is subscriptions. We sell people subscriptions. They get razors in the mail. Um, and then, ideally, they sort of continue getting razors in the mail for all of the foreseeable future. So we're going to talk about how we think about analyzing our subscription business. Specifically, what we're interested in is we're interested in what are the attributes of customers or the behavior of customers or the things that we do that influence how long these customers are on subscriptions. So this is like one example of how we might think about a customer on a subscription. They might start a free trial. They get a trial box. They have a series of orders that get shipped to them over some amount of time. And then eventually, they cancel their subscription. So we want to sort of be doing things that make our customers as happy as possible. We want to be sort of, um, we want to know which of our customers are more likely to to churn out, to cancel their subscription, versus ones who are less likely to churn. Um, so we're really interested in understanding how we can maximize the length of time between when that free trial starts and when that customer cancels their subscription. So the motivating example that we're going to talk a little bit about today, um, this came up earlier this, earlier this year, but it's sort of an ongoing question that we think a lot about, is how does the initial basket size impact retention? So this is a screen you might see on our free trial flow where you're getting sort of, you see some options for some different subscriptions. Um, what the default here is really matters. As anybody who's in sort of e-commerce knows, um, what you show on the screen will impact what people eventually decide. Um, the interesting thing for us is that a winner on this page from conversion rate or even from like margin um, on the day might not be the winner overall for our business. Because if customers in one of these baskets have lower um, retention overall, the overall impact on our business could be different. So we might want to default people into a different size plan depending on what the, what the impact on retention is. And so we definitely think about it in this case, but we think about that in lots and lots and lots of other cases. We want to know how what we're doing is impacting overall retention, because overall retention across six months, nine months, 12 months is actually what is going to most impact the health of our business. So we talk a lot about the time between subscription start and subscription end, uh, but there's a whole bunch of other people and businesses who have similar problems where you're thinking about the time between events. You might think about the time between when you purchase a mattress and whether or not they return it within 100 days, if you have a 100-day return policy. You might think about the time between um, initial lead gen and eventual contract signing if you're a software as a service business. You might think about the time between hospital or doctor's visits if you're a company that's trying to maximize the health of, of your customers. Turns out this is actually a hard problem. Um, a lot of the tools that we would normally apply uh, to lots of other analyses, like counts and averages, don't really work very well. So three example users, Joe, Gordon, and Cameron, all of them start subscriptions in October. Joe ends his subscription 14 days later. If you look at average or median, it's both 14 days. This is not a good representation of what is going on with our business, right? Cameron has already, has been on the subscription for only three days, but we don't know what happens to her, right? Could be two years from now she's still on a subscription. Same thing with Gordon. He's already been on a subscription for at least 14 days. So what we need is we need a technique that can make use of these data even when we have uncertainty and missing data in our data set. So here's where the Kaplan-Meier estimator comes in. So this was a technique. Um, this paper came from 1958, I believe, which they barely had computers then. A lot of these people were going to be doing these analyses with pencil and paper. But it's a really, really powerful technique for exactly this situation. So if you've been kicking around the analytics space for a while, you might have seen curves that look like this. A lot of times they're called survival curves. You see percent, percent survival on the y-axis there. It's sort of a morbid name because it's actually a morbid application. Um, the reason why this, people wanted to use this technique was from clinical trials. So if you imagine you've developed a new drug to treat cancer patients, what you really want to see is whether or not your drug is better than another drug or better than placebo for 
um, maximizing the survival of those patients over some period, right? So ideally, you test your drug, it increases the length of survival for your cancer patients, and you can sort of check that box when you're working with the FDA. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend a little bit of time giving you guys intuition for how this technique actually works in the hood. It's relatively straightforward, but it, once you get this intuition for like what the trick here is, um, hopefully you'll be able to sort of seamlessly apply it to some of your own problems. So here we've got eight subjects in a clinical trial. Um, you have a trial start date, you have a trial end date. Um, the X's here mean, is, mean a patient died, right? So um, one patient in the treatment arm died and two patients in the placebo arm died. The circles are what's really interesting. These are the patients who are lost to follow up. We don't have data for them after a certain point. And that's because you think about clinical trial, um, it's a, sort of a pain for the, the patients who are in it. Um, you have to go to the doctor uh, every week, you fill out a bunch of forms, you fill out survey questions, you have to get blood drawn, depending on what the trial is. A lot of people don't like it, they just stop going. Maybe they change their phone number, maybe they move away. We don't know what happens to them. We know that they were in the trial for a while and then they stopped showing up. And so this is a really interesting problem because if you were just to look at this data, you might not know what to do, how to compare this treatment and this placebo arm. So if we think about it, right, half of the people in the placebo arm died, two out of four, and then of the patients in the treatment arm who we have complete data for, half of them die, right? So if you throw out this, these incomplete data, then you're gonna say the treatment and the placebo are no different, so this drug doesn't work. Kaplan-Meier analysis is gonna give us some tools for doing better than that. So, the intuition behind how this works is that in every discrete period in your trial, you want to calculate the marginal death rate. So a discrete period could be a day, it could be a week, it could be a month, whatever it is. Um, what you want to know is you want to know the patients who died in that period, and you want to divide that by the patients who were exposed to death in that period. This idea of exposure, again, sort of technical, pops up all over the literature. Um, but basically what it means is the patients who could have died during that period. So, not all of the patients could have died during any given period because some patients will have already died in earlier periods and some patients will have been censored. They've been lost to follow up. So really like the nifty intuition behind this technique is that we're gonna try to keep close track of this denominator in the right way and that's gonna give us the ability to generate these cumulative survival curves really nicely. So cumulative survival, um, this is basically what the math looks like. Capital pi means cumulative product. Right? So all that we're gonna do is we're gonna take one minus the cumulative product of the marginal death rate. Keep that in the back of your mind. Again, to sort of drive the intuition for this home, you think about flipping a coin, you flip a quarter one time, what's the chance of it being heads? It's 50%. Flip a quarter two times, what's the chance of them both being heads? It's 50% times 50%, it's 25%. So that's the idea behind this cumulative product for figuring out what the cumulative survival is at any given period.